We're one step away from the end. We're next to the end. Uh, we got uh, this is one one number six uh, out, of, out of seven because <clears throat> we're going to combine. We're combining. Uh, I will tell you. I will tell you now. The last one, it, uh, one God and Father of us all. And we're going to combine that as though it were one. I, I don't think it was really meant to be two separate ones, or he would have separated them. Uh, so we'll deal with that next week. But so we're down to the next to the last one. And the next to the last one is one baptism. Okay. You and I both know that our world, and the religious world, secular world, gospel world, every world, uh, other than the world of the body of Christ has a different concept and a different understanding of what does baptism mean and how it should be used and what's its function and what significance does it have. Um, now, it doesn't really matter what any of us think about it or what anybody else thinks about it or what anybody else thinks about it that may be more educated and more uh, professional than any of us or less because it doesn't matter what we think it's matter what we got said and so when we get our thoughts lined up with um, a God then we have unity the unity comes as with all the other things this is no different the unity comes when we we agree on what God said and then put it into practice when we do that, we have unity. When we don't do that, we don't have unity. No matter what uh, what the science says on your building where you go to church, doesn't matter. It can have the right name and not be unified. It can have the wrong name and be closer. If, if that's the only difference and we get that straightened out, then we'd be unified, okay? So let's talk about the unity here. What, what are we talking about? Okay, number one, let's get one thing out of <coughs> excuse me. Let's get one thing out of the way to begin with. When you start looking at the Bible, there are multiple baptisms. There is not just one baptism. All right. So we need to look at that and see how that fits into God's scheme and what how it how it works with us today. So first of all, I want you to turn. In verse uh, Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to read the first couple of verses. It says, I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea and they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So, the, the first baptism that takes place was baptism according to Paul in the Moses. Well, I thought all baptisms were into Christ. No, they're not. This one was into, into Moses. Now, this takes place in uh, Exodus chapter 14. It's the chapter he, or the, the situation he is um, referring back to. And uh, you will recall that um, the children of Israel get to the Red Sea and they're ready to uh, Pharaoh's armies not far behind and uh, they're ready to no doubt knowing that Pharaoh's armies close behind uh, they are probably anxiously awaiting the boats that are going to take them across the water or however it is they're going to get across because they haven't, there's no preparation here that they can see. And while they are standing there and waiting, and no, we're not talking about, you know, 25 people here, we're talking millions, okay? And they're ready to cross and God says something that I think is significant. His order, his orders to the Israelites through Moses. Would you like to guess what it is? Do you remember what he said? 
Two words. Stand still. Huh? Do what? We ought to be doing something. I mean, you know, if you don't have boats here ready, can we at least start finding logs or something to float across them? The idea of standing still is ridiculous. You do not know what is behind us. Have you forgotten? We just left Egypt and Pharaoh decided he doesn't want us to leave and he's coming after us. I don't know whether they could hear the chariots in the background or not. There are, there are movies and their TV shows that have showed that they could, but I don't know that they could, simply because there is something behind them. What's behind them? What's behind Pharaoh's them? Army. Well, yeah, but what's between Pharaoh's army and his army? Yeah, the cloud. The cloud. The cloud. Okay, now it was it and was it also soundproof? I don't know, but it could be. They may not hear any of that. God knows where they're at. God knows what's going on. God's got it all worked out. So at the right at the point in time, Moses does what God tells him to do, and what happens? The Red Sea parts. And now if I've got a million people here. That's not a small part. Okay? Our flail board stories have shown that to be quite small. But if it were that small, it would take forever to get the people over uh, across on dry ground. But it may have been a lot wider than we've ever imagined as far as how wide the water was pushed back. It, it stood on edge. Okay? And the cloud covered the Israelites as they crossed over. And that's called baptism. Why is it called baptism? It's called What's baptism. happened? What's happened? It would, it would be the same as baptism. They are covered by water. Not literal water either way. But they've got water on both sides and a cloud above them which clouds designate water. And so they are baptized because they are immersed in the water as God carries them on dry ground across the Red Sea. And of course, then Pharaoh's army comes in after them and the uh, suspension of water stops and uh, Pharaoh's army is completely destroyed by the <clears throat> water of the Red Sea. But this is our first indication of baptism. Um, now, the next baptism we got is talked about in Mark chapter 1, and that's the bab John's baptism, which was a baptism unto repentance. John preaching repent and be baptized. Does he say repent and be baptized and be saved? No. He says repent. He preaches a baptism of repentance. If you want to change your ways and you realize you are in, in uh, contrast or in conflict with God's law, you can be baptized for repentance. You're signifying that you're sorry for what you did and, and you're signifying that sorrow by being baptized. But salvation and, more importantly, the Holy Spirit is not part of John's baptism. We'll see that in a little bit. Um, okay? Now, Jesus promises the baptism of the Holy Spirit to a group of people. What group of people does he promise it to? When he's on the earth. The apostles. The apostles. Okay, he said you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now that's important. So there's a Holy Spirit baptism in Scripture. There's a baptism of fire uh, and fire, baptism and fire, which uh, Jesus talks about with Nicodemus. And there's uh, the baptism which takes place in water. The dictionary, pick any of them you want, uh, the dictionary gives a lot of definitions for baptism. 
Um, the world practices many variations of baptism. All right. What is the root cause? I think it's safe to say this. That what is the root cause for so many variations on baptism? Why isn't there agreement? I mean, isn't it? I mean, we agree on a lot of things. I mean, we don't agree on it. You know, look, we don't agree with everybody on everything. But there, are, there are. You know, if I ask you what uh, direction does the sun come up from, it's really not. You know, there's not a lot of discussion there. Um, there may be a few people that don't know the direction and think it comes from the north, but. By and large, most people believe that it rises in the east and it sets in the west. Oh, okay, that's we consider that a fact. You know, that's a scientific fact. We well, we it's can not define even scientific <laughs> because the world <laughs> right. We can we, we can define and we can agree on all kinds of things. Yeah. As a nation, as a people, as a population, but not on baptism. Now, I know you can tell me Satan's involved, and I'm going to argue the point, but I want, I want to know, I want you to think, why is this a problem? What does the word baptism mean? Dip, plunge, or immerse. In okay, the water. well, then why don't we dip, plunge, or immerse, since we know what the word means? Because we do that to babies. Well, that's, that's a good point. I mean, that's a very good point. Question. Why didn't they translate it in the Bible? Wouldn't that have solved it? Suppose they said, repent and be immersed, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the mission of sins. Would, we, would there have been a discussion over what the word immerse means? Well, if the translators had translated it mm -hmm. accurately, it would say to be immersed. Exactly. Why didn't that? Because the king at that okay. time was not baptized. That's right. Goes back to the original land, the original translation of the Bible into English was King James Version, sixteen eleven, and uh, in sixteen eleven, King James had not been immersed. And since they were doing it for the king and by the king's decree, and they realized the king had a fair and sharp sword and axe to with which he did not mind causing people to lose their heads, they they decided it'd be a better part of valor to not translate the word, but to what? Transliterate the word, which means what? means you take the Greek letters that you have. You don't have a complete set. It doesn't spell out perfectly. But you take the Greek letters you have and you arrange them and you put letters in between enough to make a word. The closest you can. So baptizo, which is the, which is the Greek, uh, more or less what it <coughs> would spell out to be, was translated baptism. That got everybody off the hook. It also sold a lot more Bibles. I mean, we can. Why don't we translate it today? Same right. We know what it means. Yeah. So why in the thunder don't we do it? Why don't we, as the body of Christ, translate a Bible with the word "immerse" every time it says "baptism"? Because we wouldn't sell any Bibles. They would sit on the shelf because the people who are not wanting to be obedient to God are not going to be any more are not going to want a Bible that constantly reminds them that they should have been immersed and for economic reasons and otherwise that we make these choices all right so <clears throat> now let's look at the one baptism that's spoken <clears throat> by God uh, which is what we're talking about in Ephesians uh, chapter 1. Uh, I'm sorry, chapter 4. Uh, look at Acts chapter 19. We'll go there next. 
And here again, uh, beginning in verse 1, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples. Okay, now remember, our, our one statements are all in the book of Ephesians. All right? And verses four, chapter one, verses four and five. All right? So Paul arrives in Ephesus and preaches to the people he will address in the letter known as the Ephesians. So uh, do, the, do the Ephesians. So in verse two, Paul asks them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in one coming after him, that is in Christ, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. All right. The baptism of John was for repentance, but it did not include the gift of the Holy Spirit. You had no contact with the Holy Spirit, and it was not in the name of Christ. But why wasn't it in the name of Christ? Because he was still alive when John was doing baptism. Okay? I can't baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of your sins and Jesus is still walking around on the earth. It, it hasn't happened. <clears throat> yeah, baptism for the remission of sins is only for the remission of sins after Christ dies on the cross. So the baptism of John, while it served a purpose, it did not bring you into the body of Christ. Christ would have had, it would have been uh, challenging for John to have baptized Jesus into the name of Jesus for the remission of Jesus' sins when Jesus had no sin to be forgiven of. So, did you receive the Holy Spirit? They didn't even, they didn't even know what the Holy Spirit was. They couldn't be baptized into it or receive it because they had the they had no idea what it was. Um, now, they experienced two baptisms. They were baptized first in John's baptism, and then they were rebaptized in the Christ. John's baptism did not serve the full purpose. And therefore, it had to be had to be um, done again. Um, does that mean then that John's baptism was or was not recognized by God? Not not as an issue of salvation. Okay. Not as an issue of salvation, they were, baptized, they were baptized, and God would God allowed it to happen. God permitted it to happen. God wanted it to happen. Why? Because it was in preparation for what was to come. I was getting people ready for the idea. You have John is baptizing John the baptizer. I don't like the John the Baptist. John the baptizer, because that's what he was doing. He was baptizing. All right. He was baptizing the people, though. He couldn't baptize them into Christ. He couldn't baptize them and, and have them become members of the body of Christ. There is no church at this time. He is baptizing them for repentance because he's getting them moving toward what's fixing to come. You wouldn't have to be baptized in John's baptism to be baptized in Christ like not, not a prerequisite, but certainly a good guide. If you if you acknowledge the need for baptism as a matter of repentance, it wouldn't be as big a jump, it wouldn't be as big a leap to go from that 
being baptized into the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. In fact, it would mean the completion of the idea, if you will. <clears throat> so you've got, you've got uh, John doing his baptizing by the will of God. I mean, he's doing what he's supposed to do. Um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit could not be obeyed. Rather, it was promised to certain people under certain conditions. The baptism commanded was into the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, there are two baptisms. Two baptism into the Holy Spirit. Or baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's two. There's two. Yeah. Okay. Would somebody like to tell me? I bet everybody knows what one of them is. One of them, well, actually, neither one of them are that complicated. But we know one because we talk about it more than we do the other. When were people baptized? When were people. Uh, given the gift of the Holy Spirit or, or the Holy Spirit came on people before they were baptized. Twice. Twice in history. Cornelius. Cornelius is one. And the other one is? Uh, Hello. Can't think of it. This is not hard. Do what? No. What about in Acts 2 where tongues of fire come and sit on that's a that is a indwelling and an engulfing of the Holy Spirit that takes place in Acts two. What you have here is why this is significant. It happens twice, and both times are basically for the same reason. How do you know the apostles are who they say they are? How do you know you should listen to these guys? Who are these guys? I mean, they're fishermen. They're, they're, they're just folks. But before they start to speak, before they Peter preaches that first gospel sermon, you have wind, you have noise, you have fire, you have all kinds of God saying, this is coming. This is what I promised. I promised I'd send that comforter back to keep you well educated and taught. But that's the reason we have Pentecostals today that say, if you're going to be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit, then you've got to have this same experience because I went to, when I was a kid, yeah. I went to church services with my cousins and stuff. And they spent about five hours trying to get the Holy Spirit in me. Never did make it, did Never they? did because I never spoke in tongues right. or anything like that. Now, that is, uh, uh, when they say, how do you know whenever you were baptized? Mm -hmm. And you might have had a good feeling, but it wasn't the Holy Spirit, but yet you received the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, how do I know that? How do we know that? By faith and no other way. <clears throat> how do you know we're saved? How do you know your sins were worshiped? I would ask them the same thing. How do they know their well, That's the problem How we do they have know? with Pentecostals today because right. they will not. I know. They say we've got to receive this okay. this this power to speak in, yeah. in tongues right. or we don't have the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But the problem is they can't prove their salvation either. They were put up, they were they were immersed, you know, that's the way they practiced their baptism. They were immersed. And right as we're immersed. And there's not one of us in here that can prove we're saved. 
You can't prove it. You can know it. The Bible says you can know it. But how do you know it? By faith. Because you didn't get a certificate from God. You got one from Dale. Or from where we were baptized. You know. But I'm not sure that's going to hold up real well in the day of judgment. What is going to hold up? I was baptized for the remission of sins, having heard the gospel, believed it, repented of my sins, and confessed Christ. I was then immersed in water, and I was saved because I obeyed what God told me to do. Now, proof, none. Faith, completely. Now, how then someone says, well, then how do you know you're more saved? You're here saved, having been immersed in water, and we're not saved, having been sprinkled. And I'm gonna, my answer is going to be simple. I obeyed what it said, and you didn't. Now, you may be just as saved as I am. If God accepts sprinkling, you know, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to get to heaven and see somebody down there was sprinkled and go, God kicked them out, they were immersed. Okay? Because I don't know that. But I do know what it says. And I'm not a gambler enough that I want to gamble my soul that sprinkling is just as good as immersion. Because he asks, it says to be immersed for what purpose? According to, according to Acts 2 38. You repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why was I baptized? Why does Peter say we need to be baptized? For the remission of sins. And to receive the gift of the Spirit. And as a result of that, we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right. Do you realize that the first time anyone was ever baptized in the name of Jesus Christ was on Pentecost? We sometimes skip over that. We shouldn't. Because the baptism of John was not in the name of Jesus Christ. That's a new wrinkle. That's a new thing. That came with the knowledge that came with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which came when the tongues of fire set on their heads. Now we have one other time. And you've already mentioned, that's Cornelius. Okay? Cornelius receives the, the Holy Spirit before he's baptized. Look at Acts 10, beginning in verse 43. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the messages. The, the, the circumcised uh, believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, now, question. Well, I'll go ahead and finish. I mean, I'll ask. Uh, then Peter says, can anyone keep these uh, people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them a few days. Okay. Why? Were the Gentiles, Cornelius and his household, why were they allowed or given or had the baptism of the Holy Spirit and receiving the Holy Spirit? Why is that? Why was that done before they were baptized? That doesn't make any sense. Peter just said you have to be baptized to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then, in the same breath, or a few days later, weeks, well, a few weeks later. Peter's in a room, and all of a sudden, he goes just opposite of what it says. 
I mean, it's backwards. He said, you're baptized, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here these Gentiles are, receiving the Holy Spirit, and then... That was so that they knew the Gentiles could be baptized. Uh-huh. Okay. It was a sign of saying it's okay Exactly, to exactly. It's the same thing that happened to the apostles. How do we know these men are worth listening to? Because they have the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but convincing somebody in a Pentecostal movement of that is very difficult. Well, I know that. Because uh, they say, here it is, black and white. Oh, yeah, I know they do. And then, but, you know, but, I'm, but I'm telling you that the reason it's in black and white is because it happened, number one. It's a fact. It's not anything we have to deny and go, well, maybe they didn't mean that. No, he may never word of it. But why did he do it? And how many times, how many times would it have been after that? Try none. Okay? Well, they except already, over in uh, the 19th chapter uh, well, now, of uh, Acts, they receive. did receive the Holy Spirit after they after were baptized. They were baptized. Yes. And uh, it, was, like we do. it was that way. Yeah. Because, but it, yeah. They say, yeah, that's a proof, though, that you are baptized the right way. And they believe in baptism sure and dunking do. underwater and all of that, but they believe huh? that you can, you've got to have that uh, power exhibited mm -hmm. in you. And it comes later. Says it that you come. have the, the spirit. It does not come God, in baptism. And that's a baptism that. of the Holy Spirit. And it will come later, years later, months later. I know because I talked to them. Yeah. And that's their belief. But that's not the Bible. The Bible says in, in, both, uh, in these two cases, we just brought the only two cases we got. In both cases, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is connected to physical baptism. Yes, it's backwards. One comes before the other. That's true. But it's not separated by months and years and decades. Okay? It's together at the same time. The only reason that it's, back, it's backwards, as we would say, or reverse order, is because God is using the Holy Spirit to indicate who and who should not be baptized. I always thought it was funny. I get amused easily. When Peter says, on the day of Pentecost, that the Spirit will, the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on who? All nations. But when he goes to Cornelius' house, he goes, can't go there. Why not? You're the one, Peter, who said the Gentiles are in. You're the first person to say that. But you see, when Peter said that, he didn't mean all nations as in Gentiles. He meant all Jews, all Jews in every nation. Because he didn't understand the full impact of even what he was saying. I, always, I think that's remarkable. I don't think that I don't think that he was babbling. In other words, I don't think he was saying something that he really didn't physically understand. He understood it, but the way he understood it was that it was going to be still a non-Gentile world. Otherwise, he would have gone to Cornelius without any problem at all. And if you recall from uh, previous verses in chapter <clears throat> 10 uh, what does it take for Peter to get up and go to uh, Cornelius house? a vision and not just a, a vision but a lengthy vision because he has to have it shown to him three times before he and finally he goes okay <laughs> so he goes good God, and God I'm being facetious now but God says whew, he finally got it and then he gets there and he goes, Hi, I'm not going to do it. And, and, and God's going, Okay, <coughs> try this. You know, God keeps pursuing and teaching Peter as well as the people with Peter and us as well. Then God has now accepted the Gentiles. So the idea 
uh, that <coughs> the the Gentiles, for <coughs> for example, uh, in verse forty four, the the spirit falls on them, and they begin to what speaking in tongues even. Why do they need to speak in tongues? There's no way, there's no foreign language. I mean, there's nobody there that doesn't understand their language. So why would they do that? As a proof to Peter and the Jews who are there that they are now ready for baptism. How is that a proof to Peter and the Jews? They're when speaking they, in the native, native tongue. Right, but, but also... When the apostles received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what did they start doing? Speaking in tongues. And again, we're not talking Babel. We're not talking, a far, we're talking a language they did not understand. That's all it means to speak in tongues. Could be better translated as language. It's sure, it would probably be better. Uh, but even then, they would, there would still be the angelic language. I'm sure the people would have still had a problem with it. But it only means for a language you don't know. And there's no reason for the Cornelius' group to speak in a tongue that was foreign to, the, to Hebrew or whatever Gentile language they spoke. So if they spoke in Aramaic, we'll say for the moment, they spoke in Aramaic, what would be the purpose of that? Well, it wasn't because they, there was any Aramaic people that they, need, that they need to talk to. But God has got to prove to these Jews that it's okay. And Peter's going to come back to Jerusalem, and he's going to say, yeah, it's okay. And I, as much as I've, but he did, I'm, I'm paraphrasing Peter, but Peter says, as much as I fought, trust him, I did everything I could to keep it from happening. Because I didn't think it was right, but God would not let go, and He forced me to accept the reality that the Gentiles were now part of God's plan, and they were baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. Now, when they were baptized into the Jesus Christ, what happened? They received forgiveness of sins. Now, notice that being baptized in the Holy Spirit did not save them. They didn't go, okay, I got it. Because I can now speak in tongues, I'm saved. They spoke in tongues, and then they were baptized for the remission of sins. Baptism for the remission of sins is an absolute necessity, a requirement, and there is no way around it under any circumstances that we can find. Um, all right, now, we're going to talk quickly and briefly, and I'm sorry we're going to stay a little long, but we're going to talk a little bit about water baptism because it's important. In Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and following, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into, his, into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too, we too may <clears throat> live a new life. Water baptism is essential. It's not optional. It is not for any other purpose than salvation. It's not an outward sign of an inward conviction. That's not its purpose. Now, is it an outward sign of an inward conviction? Possibly so, but that's not why you, that's not why it's done. Well, someone says, looks to me like you're a it says that, you know, we're saved by faith, not by works. It looks to me like baptism is work. Where's the, what's the work? Well, you have to be immersed. Who's doing the work? The other I'm, not person doing, I'm not doing the baptizing work. You. I'm not doing the work. You're just submitting. Even, even if you call it a work, which it's not. It is not a work. 
It's a completion of an agreement God made. God said, here's what you got to do to be saved, man. Mark 16, 15, 16, Acts 2, 38, and uh, many others. You must be immersed in water to be saved. That's fact. Now, is it an act of faith? Yeah. Is it an act of obedience? Of course it is. So you got faith, you got obedience. It's an act of repentance. It's all the things that combine together as a completion of an idea. And the idea is that water baptism is necessary for salvation. We recall last week or the week before, uh, we're talking about the Apostle Paul. And Paul says, uh, uh, and I says to Saul, uh, arise and be baptized in what? Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Well, that means he still had sins. After he'd seen Jesus, talked to Jesus, conversed with Jesus, we given the plan for his life and sent to Damascus. And there, we told you what you must do, and you must be immersed in water for the purpose of washing away his sins. So until he got under the water, he was still in sin. Now, is it the water that saves us? No. It is the obedience to God. God could have said, you must be baptized in whipped cream. Okay? It wouldn't have mattered. He didn't say that. But he could have said that. He could have said you could be baptized in milk. He could have said anything. And whatever he said is what we would need to do. Not because the water makes us saved or not saved. But it's the act of obedience, which is what we're supposed to be doing. We're actively obeying, trusting God. We obey through the act of baptism. We, we have the denominational world seemingly has no problem <coughs> with any other aspect of salvation. <coughs> they don't consider belief a work. They don't consider repentance a work. They don't, but all of a sudden, this, this becomes a work. There is no work involved. Um, upon experiencing baptism, Galatians 3, 26 and 27 tells us that we put on Christ in baptism. What does that mean? It doesn't mean it's like a suit of clothes that you can put on and take off. And if I want Christ, I'll put him on. If I don't want Christ, I'll take him off way more. Hang him up in the closet and, and wait for wait till I need to begin next Sunday or whatever. We become when we're baptized, we're baptized into Christ. And that means we put on Christ, he becomes our official body. It's as though spiritually we're engulfed. In Christ. Spiritually, as we walk, think about this. As we walk through this life and we are in Christ, we have put on Christ. So, what would I see if I saw the spirit, if I saw the world through completely spiritual eyes? What would I see? I guess I would see Christ. I bet I could tell which ones are saved and which ones are lost because the ones that look like Christ, whatever that looks like, <clears throat> would be the saved one because they have put on Christ. And the ones who didn't put on Christ or play like they put on Christ but didn't escape it would be lost. I believe that's the way God sees us. I see, I think he sees us as miniature sons of his. Oh, he knows us by our name, and he knows about us and all that. What I'm saying is the the idea that we are we are never accused of any wrongdoing by Satan successfully because we're saved because we're what walking in the light, and the light makes us look just like Jesus. So he sees Ed, and he sees Eddie, and he sees Suzanne. And all the rest of us. And he knows us. He knows us well. 
knowing him better than we know ourselves. But what he read, but but he sees us through the lens, if you will, through the filter of Christ's blood. So he never sees anything wrong. Now, can we can we fall from grace? I wouldn't want to, you know, take you down the wrong path here. Make you think that I've somehow become uh, a, a liberal person that thinks everybody's going to heaven just because they believe in Jesus. That's not true. But I will tell you that you're going to have to work at it to be lost. I mean, you're going to have to actually turn your back on Christ, having been baptized in the end, and having your sins washed away. You, you can, in fact, fall away. But it's going to be pretty much an intentional act on your part or my part. I'm going to have to say, God, I really just don't care anymore. Hey, what? Why don't you give me the part of the part of the inheritance that's mine, and I'm getting out of here, and I'm going to follow the prodigal son right to the pig pit, because that's what he did. But it wasn't an in and out every day. It, you know, the father doesn't come to the prodigal son and say, "Today you're lost." And then he has to ask for forgiveness, and then he's back in again. And then he messes up, and, and the father kicks him out again, back and forth, back and forth. No. The son goes to the father and says, I want out. He has to work at it to fall out of grace. It can be done, but you've got to, you've got to put some effort into it. Is that you lead a Christian life, and we all are sin, we all fall short of the glory of God constantly, but we're all forgiven because we are attempting to follow, follow Christ and follow in the light, having been baptized into his death and putting him on in baptism. It's important. It's nothing to be minimized, and it hasn't changed. I think sometimes our brethren think that it has. We, we, we are beginning to lose our, our feeling of necessity of going through the steps of salvation. I'm using words they don't like. They don't like the word pattern. They don't like the word steps. They don't like the word all these things because it seems too mechanical. And we want it to be a relationship, okay? I want it to be a relationship too. I'm not against the relationship, but I am concerned about how we get into that relationship and how we stay in that relationship. And it requires trust and obedience. Trust and obedience to get into the relationship and trust and obedience to stay in the relationship. But it's not an in and out, oops, I lost it. Ten minutes ago, and I got it. Fortunately, I was able to live long enough to pray that significant prayer. God forgive me of my many sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Which I have to say very quickly because a lightning bolt could hit me in the middle of that and might be lost. No, we are in Christ. And because we're in Christ, we're following Him. Now, we can choose not to. But it will be a conscious choice on our part. So, I want to leave you with that thought. Now you know about the one baptism. What is the one baptism? The one baptism is baptism by water, underwater, through water, immersed in water. For what purpose? The remission of sins. That's the one baptism that makes us fit into the unity of Christ. Thank you. Sorry I kept you a few minutes. Sorry.